Okay, welcome back to Wages and Employment at Wilfrid Laurier University. Today we're going to look at how we model the demand for labor with a short run view in mind. For reference, you should pair this video with readings in chapter five of your textbook. When we talk about the demand for labor, we have to keep in mind that the labor itself is only demanded to the extent that it can be used to produce other goods. The demand for auto workers, for example, really depends on how many cars and trucks people want to buy. So the demand for labor here is derived and it will depend in part on how the goods or services market is structured. For the most part, we will consider a market with perfect competition, but there are other structures to consider here. When talking about labor demand, we will make a clear distinction between the long run and the short run. In the long run, we can think about changing any of our factors of production in response to a change in input prices or other factors affecting demand. But in the short run, we can only change the amount of labor we use in production. Here, we're going to look at a competitive firm interested in maximizing its profits. They can produce output Q using only capital K and labor N as inputs. For each unit of output, they can charge a price P in the market. They have to pay for the inputs they use, paying rent on any capital and wages for any labor. Their capital is a fixed cost and thus a sunk cost here. So it doesn't enter the problem so directly for a profit maximizing firm. Instead, they focus on how much labor to use in their production process. When we work through our first order conditions, we have this simple result where firms will be finding those peak profits if they choose an amount of labor such that the value of the marginal product of labor equal to the marginal physical product of labor multiplied by its price is equal to the wage rate. In other words, what the firm gets out of hiring that extra unit of labor should be equal to what they're having to pay for that extra unit of labor. We can map that relationship between the optimal amount of labor demanded at each given wage rate in the market, which is shown here for a competitive firm. This represents the points where the marginal benefit, i.e. the value of the marginal product of employing labor is equal to the wage rate. But with the profit maximization problem in mind, we know that when wages are higher than the average revenue product of labor, the firm is losing money. In other words, profits are negative, so it would shut down. That effectively places an upper bound on labor demanded with this firm. We can find that upper bound by adding in our curve for the average revenue product of labor. The firm's short run demand for labor is then the thicker curve in purple here. A couple of things to keep in mind when thinking about the demand side of this market. We've described a firm that is competitive in both the goods market and the labor market. When a firm is a monopoly, their profit maximization problem is different. Since they aren't price takers, both the marginal physical product of labor and the marginal revenue of output are a function of how much labor is used. But the general problem is mostly the same with firms hiring labor up to that point where the benefit of hiring one more unit is equal to the cost of hiring that extra unit of labor. We also want to consider the case of the monopsony. This is the case where firms are not competitive and can influence what wages are being offered in the labor market. We'll take this up in chapter seven when we return to thinking about how the labor market functions when supply and demand come together. In our next video, we will look at how firms make decisions in the long run when all inputs are variable. See you then.